All right. So um, what we have concluded so far, what we have seen so far are three types of chart sources. One is the spherical volume chart. The other was the infinite line chart. And the last one we saw was the play, infinite planar chart. And what we found is that the electric field that is produced by those charges for the spherical charge, it goes inside the sphere. It starts at the center from zero, all right? So just to remind you, at the center, it starts from, okay? Let me just add here a page so I don't, and I will erase it. So we have the spherical charge and that's the, the charges here everywhere uniformly distributed. And then for that, we found that the electric field starts at zero at the center, goes up linearly, the maximum value. And then from here, it goes down as one over R square or R prime as we had it square, where R prime is this distance from the center. Okay, and this one is R, which is the radius of this sphere. And that's zero, R. And that is the distance from the center. Okay, then we had an infinite long line charge. So here was a line charge. And that was the, a point of reference, it's infinite. And then we, because of cylindrical symmetry, we started thinking of um, going away from this line charge in a cylindrical way, all right? So um, usually uh, if we were to draw the cylinder, all of the, if this is radius R from the charge, all of the points on the surface of this cylinder will have the same electric field. And this one from the begin, from the center of the cylinder, well, in the center, we can never go right on the charge because um, all of the formulas we have are macroscopic equations, macroscopic. We don't take into consideration what the, the dynamics when you find yourself very close to the charge. All right, because there are other types of dynamics that we have already ignored. So you are very close to the charge, but not right there, not on the charge. So it, it goes like this. So of course, it's not going to go to infinity, but our formula, the way we have developed it, it will go to, infinity. of course, it never goes to infinity, all right? But it goes as one over R. And in fact, not as fast. I mean, it's, this is the fastest, the one over R squared. In fact, this one, to, to draw it carefully, it will lo look like this. All right, and this one is gonna look faster. And finally, we have a plane, infinite, the charge is uniformly distributed, and the electric field goes like this and is independent of your distance from the plane, infinite plane. So that's what we have seen so far. So this is constant. And I, I would like you to remember this. Okay, so having said that, and in previous notes from last week, you have, I have placed those there for a summary, but I wanted to, to connect us to what we've learned so far. So here, Today, we are gonna to start looking at line charges that have been finite. So wherever we had an infinite extent, now we are gonna to go to finite extent because this is how all of our practical problems are, all right? Lines are not even in long. I mean, if you have a line like in the circuits that I showed you, they are finite in length. And the fields change if they're finite in length. So now we are gonna consider a charge which is indicated by this green bar. 
and this uh, charge is extended is along the it's a lean is a lean line all right so it extends along the z direction from point b to a of course all the charge that is the, the charge does not have direction as you can imagine but since we set the coordinate system like that we go from b to a and all of the charges distribute uniformly distributed and therefore if i assume that i have a line charge here all right and the line charge is going to be what in coulombs per unit length okay then if i multiply this distribute this density which is the distribution is uniform so the density is going to be constant all right so if i multiply this number which is the charge density with the length of my charged line then i will get the total charge all right so that's q now here there are the following things i have taken this and i have tried to put it in cylindrical coordinate system and I will show you here why you cannot use Gauss's law for this problem. All right, you remember for the infinite line charge, we used Gauss's law. And we found that the field goes as one over the distance, all right, from the axis, from the line charge. Here, we can put the line charge in a, in a cylindrical coordinate system. But, but here is what is happening. Because it is, on the axis of the cylinder, our fields are still independent of phi. You see the angle phi? You remember that the, the cylindrical coordinate system has three coordinates, rho, phi, and z. And here I show them to you. Phi, rho is the radius of you know, the cross section of the, of the cylinder. Phi is the angle as we measure it from the x coordinate. That's how we defined it. And then z, of course, is you know your z coordinate. Okay, so now because the cylinder, wherever I go around the cylinder, and, and it has a piece of the cylinder occupy, is occupied by the charge line, all right, which is finite, the piece of the axis. So if I go around, I still see the same thing which implies that my field is independent of phi. There is no phi dependence, so I can move around like that. Okay, that's good, because that tells me that I don't need really to do anything around the whole thing. I just need to be on one plane, any, any arbitrary phi angle and stay there, and then work it out and whatever I find for that phi angle, whatever you see here, all right, that I have defined by the green um, bar and by this red, which is the side, the line, all right? This, this is a plane, uh, P, P prime, that line, the red line, and the z-axis define a plane, they are parallel. So I can go on that plane that corresponds to an arbitrary phi, and whatever I find there, that's going to be true for every phi, okay? So that's what it says. Now, um, of course, there is a dependence on the radius rho, the distance that you have from this charge. We've seen that. So we will take it for granted that there is a dependence on rho. And because it's finite, we'll also take it for granted that it's going to be a dependence on z. Because, say, the point P here, if I am an observer and I go on point P here and then see measure the electric field and then go and measure the electric field on point P prime, they're not going to be the same. Even if that they are at the same distance from the Z axis. They don't see the same charge in their vicinity. One is closer to me, the other is further away in the other case. So what I will measure as an electric field is going to depend on Z as well. So that's what it says. Now, because of that, I cannot find one surface, one that encloses, totally encloses a volume. 
where the electric field is constant everywhere. And because of that, I cannot use Gauss's law, all right? The only reason I can use Gauss's law is because in the other cases, I found that enclosed surface where that was done. All right? So now, I, how I, I'm gonna solve this problem? Using Coulomb's law. All right, what does Coulomb's law say? Coulomb's law starts, we don't show it, starts with a force and says, I will write it here and then erase it, just to remind you, Coulomb's law says that if I have two charges, then there is a force between these two charges, and this force is given by that. Okay, that's Coulomb's law. Okay. Also, the Coul Coulomb's law tells us that if I divide both sides, if rather, um, I think not here. If I divide both charges by epsilon naught, because this is, in fact, this is the force, so, They, yes. If I divide both charges by epsilon naught, then I will find the electric field, and then the electric field in this case, and of course, Q1 is out at one of the two charges. So if I get this and epsilon naught, then what I found is practical. What did I say? If I divide that by Q, not epsilon naught, excuse me, what I, I have here, then all right i have electric field that is due to charge q1 so that is coulomb's law all right exactly so then i take this coulomb's law instead of charge q1 so now i don't use the force obviously i get rid of this in, in, in place of Q1, I'm using a, an infinitesimal charge, all right? Which is sitting right at DZ, the infinitesimal length. And this infinitesimal charge is given by the infinitesimal length times the constant charge density. And I call that dq because it's still infinitesimal charge, all right? And because it's so small and the length is infinitesimal, then I consider this infinitesimal charge to be a point charge. So for a point charge, I can use then what? Coulomb's law. And you notice here that instead of a sub bar, I have the same vector r, all right? You can either read, write it in terms of a sub bar. You need to remember that here. Or you can write it in terms of r only, and then it becomes r on top vector divided by the magnitude of r to the third power, all right, here. So now I start with this. Now, OK, I wrote an equation for, an for the electric field that is due to this infinitesimal charge that is sitting right here. What would I do next to find the whole field? Practically superposition, but I write the superposition here as an integral. But it is superposition. I take all the infinitesimal charges of this line and I sum them up. And the way I show that is through an integration. All right, so the total field here at point P is going to be the integral of all of these infinitesimal charges from B to A. And so that's what you see here. That's what I wrote here. And so now I have an expression for the total field E. Now you see how the total field E is for, from, for the infinitesimal charge DQ, it goes along the direction that connects my observation point to that infinitesimal charge. 
And that implies that as I integrate, the field is gonna then start moving as I go and consider the other infinitesimally small charges along the line, which means that at the end, I'm gonna have a field that has both an X and a Z component. All right, because I consider that to be, I am, for example, on the XZ plane. So I selected the XZ plane here, all right? I selected the XZ plane to do all of this work. So now I am on the XZ plane here. Let me write it so you remember it. XZ plane, that's where I work. And I said that, as long as I find something that will apply for all of the other planes that go through the Z axis. All right, so now I have an expression. And as a matter of fact, um, the expression gets simpler because I move the constant in front of the integral here. And then what remains in there is this one. Now, the only thing you have to do is to really look at, let me, in fact, I found something here that was left over. Okay, so the only thing that you have to do is to look at um, the geometry here, nothing more, and see how rho, which is the perpendicular direction from point P to the uh, line, that is charged, rho is the perpendicular distance, all right? So it's the height, if you like, on this, in this triangle, uh, BAP, and is the perpendicular, all right, the, the um, line that goes from P and cuts BA at 90 degrees. So here, this is 90. And that happens to be of obviously the distance of my point P from the Z axis, okay? So now in this triangle, which is orthogonal, the only thing that I have to do is to use simple geometry to relate rho to R or R to rho, if you like, because R varies along as I do the integration, but rho remains constant. So if I do this and I write here this expression, practically what I do is, or this one for that matter, down here, I go from R, which is a variable in my integral, to theta, to an angle, instead of changing R, I'm looking at the change of the angle theta, and that's what I use as the variable in my integral, okay? Because I, it's easier, I have these trigonometric relationships that I can use. So then from here, from three, from two and three, as I say, you take this two and you plug in, what you finally come to is this expression. All right, and as a matter of fact, because rho is constant, this rho here, I move it out here. And the only thing that I have in there is this sinus square theta. Okay, now, it's very difficult to solve for the total field E if when you integrate the direction changes, all right? You cannot then, how, how can I then talk about one E when you know the direction changes every time I go from one point on, along the line to another, to the next? So what I do is to split E as a vector into two components whose direction do not, does not change when I integrate. So I take the direction of the electric field, which is A sub R, all right? And I split it into two components, X and Z. 
because all of the X components will remain X as I integrate, all of the Z components will remain Z as I integrate. So what I'm then trying to do is instead of computing a total E to compute E sub X and then E sub Z separately, because the direction E sub X remains constant, the direction E sub Z remains constant. The values will change, all right? The magnitude will change of these components. And so to be able to do that, I take A sub R and I split this, it's a unit vector, but it's a vector. So I find the two components of, of the unit vector on the X and the Z directions, just using simple geometry from this orthogonal triangle. All right, and then I plug this in here and I find this equation, six. So I'm, I'm working very methodically. So now the only thing I have to worry about is, you know, just do my integrations. And the other thing that I have to do is since I'm going to want to have theta as my variable in the integral, I have to change everything into theta. So what is the only other parameter that does not have theta in there? That's dz, all right? Now, dz is z, for example. Before I go to dz, which is the, the, the uh, differential length along the z direction, let's go to z. Z, um, if I consider that Z equals zero ex is exactly at where, at where my um, distance, the perpendicular line from my observation point hits the uh, line integral. So if I call this point Z equals zero, then Z at this point down here is this one. This is Z here, all right? It's just that it's below Z equals zero. And then above Z equals zero, I mean, so as my DZ moves along the line, then Z is gonna change. Z is gonna change as I move from B to A, from OB to OA, all right? If I call this to be O. Okay, from OB to OA. But I don't necessarily like it to have it in this form. What I like to do is to, move, to also change Z into theta, into a, a function of theta. And if you look at this triangle again, Z here can be expressed in, as a function of rho and theta in the following form. We have that Z equals rho cotangent theta from the triangle. Therefore, if I write it like this, and if theta is the only variable on the right-hand side, then I can go down here and then try to compute differential Z. And if I do this, is gonna practically be d theta here. I forgot d theta, dz is gonna be this d theta. d theta here, d theta. And then d theta here, okay? And then so now I have moved, changed dz to a function of theta only. I have changed everything to a function of theta and I have this simple integral to solve at the end. From theta one to theta two of sine theta d theta, which finally gives me this expression eight. 
and then I can work similarly and find nine. Okay, now I don't want, I want you to understand how we did it step by step, because if you go back step by step, it's not overwhelming. But the primary thing that I want you to do is to observe these equations and see exactly what is happening. What did I find at the end of all of this analysis? I'm not going to stop here and say I'm done. So far, we have tried to use math to simplify the electric field. Is this simplistic forms that give us things to work with, all right? And what I see from here, which you're not gonna see if I were to give you a problem and go to MATLAB or go somewhere else and plug all of the values and get a value, which is gonna be correct. You're gonna get a value for the E field if you do it correctly from the beginning and it's gonna be correct. But what you are gonna miss in that process is the understanding of how this field changes. All right, so let's try to understand what is happening. Theta one is this one here. All right, from the point, I draw the line and it's the angle between the line that connects me to one end of the line and the line itself. And theta two, you remember the order has to be the same, is also the line that connects me to the other side, but you remember they have the here, use theta two, you have to use the same orientation in the angles. You cannot use the inside, the inner angle, say you cannot use this one. You cannot, you cannot use this one. You cannot use this angle, it's, it's incorrect. When you use the angles, you remember it's this, between this line, B, P, if that's P for me. Theta one is down here between B, P and B, A. And when I go from P to A, it also has, I, I have to be looking into the same direction of the Z coordinate. So theta two is up there. Okay, now that you remember this, let's see what happens when this, uh, something that we have found before. What happens when A and B, A goes to infinity, to plus infinity, and B goes to minus infinity? What happens when B goes to minus, let's, let's look at that. What happens when B goes to minus infinity? What happens to theta one? Exactly, zero. What happens therefore when theta one becomes zero? Cosine theta one becomes one. Keep that in mind. Okay, so let the impact if you wanna hear, play a little bit with that here, let's do that. So this A and B, okay, that's A and B. A goes to, let me see, make it bigger and then green. A goes to minus infinity. A B, excuse me, this is A. A goes to plus infinity and B goes to minus infinity. B, minus infinity. Which means that if I am here, if that B goes to minus infinity, this angle here that connects me to that end, this one is gonna become zero. This one, theta one, theta one is gonna tend to become zero, okay? How about theta two? Remember theta two is this one. How much is theta two gonna be? When A goes to plus infinity. Mm-hmm. 180, so theta two becomes 180. Okay, so now tell me how much is gonna be E sub X in this case? It's gonna be Q sub L from equation eight, four by epsilon naught, one over rho, and then cosine theta one is gonna become one. How about cosine theta two? negative one and a minus in front of it plus one. 
okay? So it becomes another one, which means this becomes two. And since this is two, it's gonna make, give us a two here. So finally, what we find is that this sub x is gonna be q sub l two pi epsilon naught over one over o. Does that uh, times one over o? Does that remind you something? This is what we found with Gauss's law when that became very long. So what is the learning here? When we have any length of charged line, then your component of the electric field that is perpendicular to the line is gonna always change as one over O. When the line extends, there is another component, E sub Z, but when the line extends and the line is very large, so it's so far away from you as an observer, your primary component in that case is your E sub X, is the component that goes perpendicular to your line, all right? That's what you see. Why is that important? Because if I am another line next to it, all right? So I worry if, if this is a, the green line is a microstrip line and has a charge, all right? And that's your green line and I am next to it, a line with a different chart. All right? And I don't wanna be impacted by the green line. So the only, if the, if the lines are long, all right, and close to each other, so the length, if the lines are very, you remember how close the lines were? When you, we printed them on these uh, circuits, they were close, but long, most of them not all of them, most of them. In that case, if I am sitting on the purple line and I look towards the green, I will only feel the component that comes perpendicular to me. That's the most important. So if I wanna find out how far the two lines have to be, I will only look at that component. Because if that component is strong, that implies that it's gonna impact my chart. And therefore, if I have bits that go down the line, the other line is gonna create a noise on the bits. And sometimes noise may even change the uh, state from one to zero or zero to one. So that is, you need to remember. Let's now look at some other cases. Let's assume that um, I will erase this. In fact, I will add, I don't wanna erase anything. Let me add here, page. Okay, I'll move this a little further down. All right, now let's assume that I have half line. Instead of uh, increasing on, all the way in, um, in both directions, I'm starting at this point and the line becomes semi-infinite. So B is here and then A goes to plus infinity. And let's assume that I am here and I look at this and then A goes to minus to plus infinity. So the other angle that I have there is gonna be theta one. What is gonna happen, theta two rather. What is gonna happen when A goes to plus infinity, theta two becomes what? 180, like the same as before. So theta two becomes 180 and theta one is whatever it is because it's determined by my relative position with respect to the beginning of the line. So then in that case, E sub X is gonna become Q sub L four pi epsilon one over O and then inside I'm gonna have cosine theta one plus one. All right, so now I can be either here or I can be here. If I am down there, what is theta, theta one? It's this one. All right, that's theta one when I'm down here. And my theta two, if, the, if it's not infinite long, is gonna be, if it's finite the length, 
it's gonna be here. And if it's a semi-infinite, a, a goes to plus infinity, then theta two is gonna go again to 180. And then this way you can find wherever you are, either in between A and B or away from one of them or away from the other. You can always use these formulas to find the electric field. Now, why is that? So number one, you see, you remember that your perpendicular component E is the most, the strongest, E sub X. And then you have the Z, which is along the direction of the line charge. And that is not very strong. Where is it getting strong? Let me in fact show you now, one more page. So if we were to take a finite charge, excuse me, finite line charge, and I were to plot all of the electric field lines, how would they look? Okay, I'll do this. Okay. Here, I will do it with red. They would go like this. Red. And then we'll go like that. Okay, so that's how the electric field looks. And then it, it is the same along any on any plane that, in, that um, is including the Z coordinate. So if you remember cylindrical. So if I take any plane like this, it's gonna look like, like that. That's how it looks. So in the middle of this section, the component which is perpendicular is the strongest. So when we are looking at cases like that, that's how I want you to think of the problem. Yes, I want you to understand the math, but the math is not there to exhaust us and then stop. It's for us to give us an opportunity to understand what happens physically, all right? That is the most important thing. You need to keep, keep that in mind. Now, let me see. Okay, we have time to then develop this problem. So let's try to solve this problem and I will ask you to help me with this. Let me erase all of that. So this problem says, I have a um, square and it's all charged with a uniform charge, all right? So uniform uh, charge density is constant and it's whatever, say three, Nano coulombs. Per meter, for example. And I want you now this is I, I saw that the, the square like this and now I'm going to show it like that also to get a three dimensional view of the square. Okay. Good. This one, all right. And then since this is the X direction, I put here the X, I put here the Y, and I will put here the Z. Okay, the same thing, I just saw it in 3D. And so this is A, B, C, and D. So now, um, what I want first to do is to find what is the field at the center of the square, right here. All right. So I will remove this down. Let's call that O. O. I would like to find out how much the field is there, the center of the square. How, are you, how am I gonna do this? You remember everything, 
I will find the, what it is there without using the equations. All right, that's if you know how it works, that's how you get things, okay, it's in a simple way. So at the center, let's see how I will do that. Let's assume that I look at A, B, and C, D, all right? Um, and then what I will do just to help you is the following. I will take this, I will erase that part, I don't need it. I will take this and I will turn it like that, all right? And then I'm gonna use, so at least visually, I'm gonna think what I found just before. First of all, I'm gonna use A, B. So let them write. So I don't get dizzy, A, B. And then here is C and D, C and D. Let's use A, B. From what I found before, how do you expect the field at A, B, from the A, B at the zero point to B? Okay, let's think about what we found before. If, look at these two formulas, if, my point P is at the center, like if I, if O, for example, if I take the perpendicular line that cuts the green line that has the charge at point O, if that is at the center, all right, what happens to theta one and theta two? If I, if, if the perpendicular line, so let's think. If I have this case, that's what I'm asking you right now. Let's assume that I have this line with charge and I'm going right here where this is at the center of the line. So if this is B and this is A, OB equals OA. How much is theta one? Here. How much is theta two? There. What is the relationship between theta one and theta two? Uh -huh. Theta one plus theta two is 180. Okay. Now, what happens to, let's see, now that they have that relationship, if here I have a cosine theta one and theta two is gonna be cosine of pi minus theta one. So how much is this gonna be? Mine consigned theta one. Okay, so remember, let's find the cosines here. So theta one and theta two, all right? They are the same, sorry, I don't draw very well nowadays. Okay, so theta one, and this is the, uh, theta one, and this is theta two, all right? Which is theta two, however, from the beginning of the axis, if I were to draw theta two from the beginning of the axis, it would be somewhere here. Uh, there. And this one will be the same with this one. Do you agree? All right. So cosine theta two will be minus cosine theta one. If theta two equals pi minus theta one, cosine theta two is minus cosine theta one, which does what? It makes this difference equal to two cosine theta one. So I have an E sub X. What happens to E sub Z? What happened? What is the sign of pi minus theta one? Sign theta one. So you have sign, uh, excuse me, theta one is pi minus theta two, right? So, or theta, um, two is minus pi theta one. Either 
the case, here theta one, theta two is pi, my, uh, pi minus theta one. So, sine theta two is sine pi minus theta one is sine theta one. Therefore, sine theta one minus sine theta one, what does it give? Zero. All right, even from the figure, you can say it here. So if you go to the center then, to this, if, if I am here, the observant, and my perpendicular line goes to the center of this, the only component that I have, and I will do it with red here, is this one. Okay, I don't have another one. What happens then if I look at CD? Which way the CD component is gonna go? This, yes. The electric field is gonna have only this one. Are they gonna be equal and opposite? Yes, so what happens with these two? They cancel out. So the two lines, A, B, and C, D, give no contribution at the center. Together, the two lines together, they create an electric field at the center, which is zero, all right? The same thing is gonna happen with B, C, and A, D, all right? So you always remember, if you have a finite section of line and your point cuts the line perpendicularly at this middle, then the only component you have at that point is the perpendicular to the line. That you have to keep it in mind, nothing else. And if you know that, then you find that the, at this point, the total electric field is zero at the center without going to a lot of math, all right? Without going, that's how I want you to solve problems in this class, to get a sense of what is happening. Because if, it, if you remember that, then you can use it. So um, what happens a little bit above it? Let's, let's talk a little more now. Um, see, what do you, we have not talked very much, but what do you expect is gonna happen? above point O. It's gonna always be the same thing, one over O, the distance, always one over the distance, all right? So if I'm going up here, line, straight line, if I go, north of O to another point, O prime. Let's see what the fields are from AB, all right? The field from AB, I'm still at, a, if, I, if I draw a line, if I draw a line that goes perpendicularly down to AB, it's gonna, it's gonna still cut it to the, at the middle of, because of where I am. But the electric field is gonna go like this from that, let me do it red. Electric field from that side is gonna be like this. Now let me do the other one, green. Then I will draw from my point again, down to this and I'm getting exactly at the center and the electric field I'm gonna get is gonna be this one, all right? So what happens with this electric field? It has more than just the normal component, all right? It has a normal because the two vectors go like that. So they sum, it has, they have, the in, they are, however, because of the structure, because it's a square, the vectors up there at O prime, the vectors will look like this of the electric field. And then what does that do? What happens when I sum up these vectors? How many components do you have? Because the vectors are like this, they are at, uh, symmetric and they are identical. So I will have only the vertical component because the horizontal components will cancel out. 
So along all of this line, the only electric field you have from A, B, and from C, D is gonna be along that direction. What happens with A, D, and B, C? Same thing. So what you learn is at the center of the loop, this is a square loop, at the center of the square loop, the field is zero, no field. But as I move along the vertical line up, then I start seeing a field that is perpendicular to the surface of the loop. All right, so this is how I would like you to think about these problems. And we use the formulas just to help us make sure, all right, that we are saying the correct thing. Okay, so with that, I'm not gonna give you a, um, an exercise for Wednesday. We're gonna start Wednesday again. And Wednesday, we are gonna go to a loop, to a circular loop. Well, what do you expect? Same thing, all right? I mean, if I were to give you only the square loop and say now generalize to the circular loop, you would tell me exactly the same thing. At the center of the circular loop, there is no electric field. But as I move down, I moved up on the line perpendicular to the surface of the loop, then I start seeing a vertical component. All right, so from that point of view, nothing has changed. The formulas will be slightly different, all right? So this is, these are fundamental structures that are important to use, all right? A circular, why circular is important? Because we do loop inductors. So it is important to know whether you have charges on a loop inductor, you will have charges give rise to capacitance. So if I create a loop inductor, it's called, for inductors, and I have parasitic capacitance, that's a bad deal. Okay, so we are trying to think along those ways. All right, so we'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Question about the recordings, about the first lectures. Is there any way I could access these? Yes, I have them on the front page. Okay, because well, yeah, I don't want where it's like the media site collection. It's not media site. Oh, Let me show you here. Uh, okay, yeah. Oh, they are on YouTube. I was looking at the media site and I was like, no, so they are on away. YouTube. See, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, for the first few weeks of class, I was in the uh, incorrect year. For Tom Pat, is it possible to get points back? I have to. I have to work for those. Uh, so there is. What is going to happen is that I can do it anything right now, but there is going to be a makeup assignment. So you you see how many points you've missed, and then um, you can try to make as many as you can for the makeup assignment. Okay. It will be after the meter. Okay.